Um, the commons have been my passion for about the past 15 years. And the shift in my energies came when I started to become somewhat disillusioned in the mid-1990s <clears throat> with the liberal imaginary as a vehicle for, a credible vehicle for change. And uh, I recognized at the same time the powerful surge of commons-based alternatives on the periphery mm -hmm. of mainstream politics and culture and how there were the seeds of enormous potential there in, in many, many ways, pragmatically, theoretically, uh, culturally. So in my talk, I'd like to introduce the commons as both a very new, a very old, and yet very new, recently rediscovered paradigm of governance and resource management. And I will attempt to explain the great appeal of the commons on many levels, political, policy levels, cultural, social, personal, even spiritual, and describe the scope of the worldwide movement, if that's quite the right term, because we associate movements with something, I think, different than we see here, for ex expanding the social practices and discourse of the commons. And let me just say up front that the commons is neither a totalizing political ideology nor a PR branding, rebranding of the public interest. It's a general template of governance that has deep roots in human history uh, as a system of self-provisioning, self responsible resource management, and mutual support. But in some ways, that states the issue, I think, too clinically, too analytically, because at the heart of the commons is an ethic, which I think is a way of being human that goes beyond homo economicus, the rational, utility-maximizing, self-interested, uh, ideal of a human being that economists and politicians say that we are. Because the commons presumes that human beings are more complex and that a richer set of human behaviors can be designed into our institutions, not simply tacked on. And so the commons asserts that there is an important role for self-organized governance that both challenges and complements formal government. So in a, let's just start to wade into the topic. In the most general sense, I think the commons is about stewardship of the things that we own in common as human beings. It's about ensuring that we protect them and pass them on undiminished to future generations. And that includes a wide variety of things, from inherited knowledge and culture to the integrity of natural ecosystems, public spaces and community traditions, civil, civic infrastructure, uh, subsistence commons of forests, fisheries, uh, farming, and countless other shared resources that we either morally or legally own. But the strangest thing about the commons is that these forms of provisioning are essentially invisible because they, ex they exist outside of the state or the market. In general, they're not seen as valuable when they're recognized at all because most commons have little to do with property rights, markets, or geopolitical power. Even though subsistence commons meet the needs of an estimated two billion people uh, throughout the world, two of the most popular uh, introductory economics textbooks in the United States, one by Samuelson and Nordhaus, the other by Steiglitz and Walsh, entirely ignore the commons as a viable, attractive provisioning model. And I might add that subsistence is not simply about mere survival, but about meeting household needs as opposed to maximizing market exchange. So given its invisibility, uh, commons worldwide are not so surprisingly being overwhelmed and destroyed by market forces today, often with disastrous results. And so the challenge for us, I think, is to see the commons and then to find new ways to support and protect it. Now, for most people, any mention of the word commons immediately brings to mind the word tragedy, and that becomes the end of discussion. If you listen to most economists, the commons is said to re result in tragedy. And the, the classic story told is if you have a, a shared pasture upon which there's many sheep or cattle can graze, no single herder will have a rational ex reason for holding back his or her individual use of the commons. And so they'll put as many cattle on it as they can. And uh, this will inevitably lead to its over-exploitation and ruin or the tragedy. Now this dogma has held sway in the public mind, uh, and especially among economists, since 1968 when Garrett Hardin, who was a biologist and ecologist, wrote the famous essay, The Tragedy of the Commons. And it became quickly a, a um, politically convenient parable 
because it implied that private property rights in markets were really what was needed to solve the tendency of people to overexploit resources. If people had private ownership rights, went thinking, uh, they would be motivated to protect their, their grazing lands and not destroy them. But the subtle thing was that Hardin was not, in fact, describing the commons. He was describing a scenario in which there are no boundaries for the grazing land, no rules for managing, and no community of users. And the simple truth is that is not a commons. That is an open access regime or a free-for-all. And a commons has boundaries. It has rules. It has monitoring of usage. It has punishment of free riders and social norms. It has a community that is willing to be a steward of the resource. So Hardin's misrepresentation of the commons and it's, uh, well, it's stuck in the public mind and quickly became an article of conventional wisdom. And for the past two generations, the commons has been widely regarded as a failed paradigm of governance. And sort of hovering in the background was always Thomas's, Thomas Hobbes's conviction that only the, the Leviathan, the powerful state, could prevent uh, us from degenerating into a law of the jungle of the nasty, brutish, and short tragedy of the commons, implicitly. And it took uh, Eleanor Ostrom, who Silka mentioned, of Indiana University, um, many years to rescue the commons from what I think was, uh, one might say, even a smear, maybe not by Hardin directly, but over time it became a smear. And it took years of painstaking field research and innovative theorizing but her path-breaking 1990 book, Governing the Commons, uh, Ostrom identified some basic design principles of successful commons. And over the past decades, she and many colleagues have shown in hundreds of, of, of hundreds of empirical studies that people can and do successfully manage their land and water and uh, forest and fisheries as commons. And many of them actually have flourished for years, such as uh, Swiss villagers who manage high mountain meadows and the Huerta irrigation institutions in Spain, which she also documented. And her great achievement was to explain how co cooperation can actually manage resources sus sustainably, often more successfully and effectively than the state or market. And her ideas forced mainstream economists to reconsider some of their basic premises, uh, which uh, which she did by applying not just straight up quantitative economic, mathematics and economics, but by bringing poly, political science, sociology, anthropology, uh, and other social sciences to bear on the topic. As Silke mentioned, she won the, the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009 for this achievement, making her the first woman to win the prize. It's always been my suspicion that her gender made her more sensitive to relations in economic behavior which the male-dominated economics profession has somehow uh, skirted past a lot. Well, the, uh, Ostrom really helped engender, develop a worldwide group of academics um, that studying a lot of small-scale commons has shown comparatively little interest in studying the political economy and how it might apply there. But a global movement of commoners uh, has shown no such reluctance to take on this very big challenge. And so over the past 10 years or so, a fledgling comics, commons movement working alongside the scholars but independent of them has developed a discourse of the commons as what I've called a new, old political philosophy and, po and policy agenda. And whether they realize it or not, commoners uh, are part of a, of a different way of knowing and a different way of acting in the world. Uh, the very act of commoning, which are the social practices of commoners in managing their shared resources, it embodies a different world view uh, and a different way of being and uh, acting in the world than those presumed by uh, the liberal polity. And I think this is a source both of great promise and tension, uh, as I hope to show. And maybe we can start by talking a little bit about the economics of the commons. I, sh I should emphasize in starting that the commons is not just a resource in itself, it's the, which is often called a common pool resource. But a commons consists of a resource plus a distinct social community and its social practices, values, and norms. And it's a sort of integrated, you might call it a socio-economic biophysical package. 
uh, sort of like a fish and a pond and aquatic vegetation. They all sort of go together and uh, depend upon each other. So you can't simply analytically parse it out into isolated elements. It doesn't quite make sense. Um, and I think this is one reason why standard economics doesn't quite get it, uh, get the commons, because it, uh, it proposes, in some ways, a different metaphysics. It, uh, unlike conventional economics, it focuses on the community as a holistic, organic entity rather than individual elements or the individual alone. It looks at the whole and sees them as interpenetrating each other. And this is a very different approach to the world than that presumed by the modern liberal state, which sees the individual as sovereign and not necessarily connected to these collective entities. And so the commons starts to recast some familiar dualities of public and private, collective and individual, objective and subjective, blurs them, mixes them in a way that it doesn't quite make sense to talk about them as separate entities. I might even add there's other dualities you might say teacher and student, um, uh, coach and player. Many of these things, I think, start to blend when seen through the commons lens. Um, I sort of like to think of it in terms of cooperative individualism, but even that term doesn't really convey what we also have to pay attention to, which is the emotional psychic dimensions of the commons. Because at bottom, the commons is also an experience and an identity. Uh, commoners love and need their resources, and so they have, or at least depend upon them, and so they tend to have uh, motivations to act as conscientious stewards and defenders of them. They have emotional, subjective relationships with the resources they manage and use, and with their fellow commoners in using them. And so they develop rituals and customs and social ethics, a, a, a culture of stewardship. And this may be why the commons is such a subversive metaphysics because it asks us to entertain a richer definition of value than that generally provided by the market or economist. It asks us to entertain a larger conception of the economy than gross domestic product. And it asks us to commit to certain to forms of value that go beyond market and prices. Economics, as traditionally construed, is, has focused about on creating wealth and eliminating scarcity. But really, it's only concerned about a certain type of wealth, wealth that has a price attached to it and that can be traded in the marketplace. That kind of wealth is usually encased in private property rights in exchange through, changed through market transactions. And the more the market transactions, the greater the wealth that is created, and supposedly the happier we are. That's the, the grand narrative. And the only problem with this standard narrative is that it doesn't really have much to say about the great stores of value that don't have price tags. How much is the Earth's atmosphere worth? How much is the human genome worth? What about fresh water supplies, our inheritance of scientific knowledge, the internet, our relationships with nature and each other? Well, a lot of this takes us back to uh, philosopher John Locke, who argued that the things that lie outside of a system of private property rights and commerce are best known as res nullius, or nullities. And they stand, uh, these things are the free things, I'm, I'm sorry, these things are free for the taking because no one really has any recognized property rights in them and there's no price for them. And all you have to do essentially is add your own labor and you're entitled to own them. That's the basic philosophical justification that many uh, conquerors and colonizers have used to claim ownership of native lands. The lands were unowned, after all, and the natives didn't have any formal property rights in them, and therefore, they're free for the taking. In, in our time, this ethic persists as people claim ownership of ethnobotanical knowledge in the global south and assert patents on genes and life forms and even synthetic nanomatter that's being created. And the logic is being used to develop wilderness areas and even to claim property rights in words uh, colors and smells under trademark law. And again, one only needs to assert property rights over something that is unowned within certain general public policy limits. And there's a, a, an interesting correspondence between John Locke's property theories and Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons because they both presume, that, again, that value can only be present with property rights and markets. And this provides ample justification for plunder. Uh, Silke uh, 
pointed out to me a wonderful Girte poem called Catechism, in which the teacher says to the child, Behold thee, child, where do those gifts come from? Something from yourself alone cannot come. The child, oh, everything, comes, everything is from Papa. Teacher, and he, where does he get them from? Child, from Grandpapa. And teacher, not so. How to your Grandpapa did they befall? Child, he took them all. And in some ways, we're, we're still grappling with that ethic as we move forward. Which brings me to the enclosure of the commons, which I like to think of, think of it as the tragedy of the market. Uh, over the course of several centuries, but of course in the 19th century in England, the aristocracy uh, colluded with Parliament to privatize the village commons of England. And the commons were essentially dismantled. Enclosure was a way for the landed gentry to make a lot of money and to consolidate their political economic power. But the great uh, unacknowledged scandal of our times, I think, is the large-scale privatization and abuse of dozens of resources that we collectively own. Today's enclosure Ooh. movement is really kind of an eerie replay of the English enclosure movement. A prime example is the great international land grab now going on in Asia, Africa, and Latin America on a massive scale as governments collude with uh, investors and foreign governments to essentially, at, with, at discount prices, give, an, give away arable land and forests in their uh, countries. Uh, in, the, in this process, commoners who had grown and harvested their food over generations as a matter of custom are being displaced, uh, forced into cities, and uh, essentially they become uh, the kinds of people we encounter in Charles Dickens' novels. Uh, they're forced to the city to search for a li livelihood, become beggars, shanty dwellers, wage uh, slaves. And I found it interesting that the news accounts of the Somali pirates rarely mentioned that many of them uh, had previously been fishermen uh, whose commons had been destroyed by industrial trawlers that just swept through and essentially destro destroyed their livelihoods. Markets have long treated nature either as a nullity or a brute object, something that has no life, no dignity in it, no connection with the sacred. But it's reaching some alarming points, as I'll try to show. Um, I find it shocking that 20% of the human genome is now patented and therefore privately owned. The biotech company Myriad Genetics of Salt Lake City claims a patent on breast cancer susceptibility genes, which guarantees a monopoly over certain types of research. And in fact, this patent is uh, scaring some researchers away because they don't want to, they'd like to do the research, but they don't want to infringe upon the patent. Uh, there's a surging nanotechnology industry developing synthetic forms of basic matter that improve upon nature and then claim proprietary control over them. And the, ambi the ambition is to substitute privately owned, engineered forms of nanomatter that will displace normal, uh, naturally occurring matter. And this process follows a familiar pattern in which Monsanto used GMO crops to displace natural seeds. Microsoft used windows to uh, eradicate many, most all other operating systems. And uh, multinational bottling companies have substituted branded proprietary water for uh, tap water. Most of these using, sometimes using the law, sometimes using market power. One of the most ambitious uh, attempted privatizations of water supplies came in Cochabamba, uh, Brazil, Bolivia in 2002 when the Bechtel Company or Corporation and the Bolivian government privatized the municipal water supply and even claimed ownership of rainwater that fell off of roofs. And there was enormous public protest that re resulted in the ouster of Bechtel and uh, a huge fight over the contract, but it, it shows the limits to which people are going. Uh, more recently, the billionaire T. Boone Pickens has spent more than $100 million acquiring groundwater aquifers in the Texas High Plains, which could make it very expensive for many of the communities that live there as water becomes privately owned. Uh, nowadays, there's certain kind of mathematical algorithms that you can't use. There's a book called Math You Can't Use, because if those algorithms are embedded in software, they're proprietary. You know, one plus one equals, can't do that. Uh, McDonald's, if you want to name your, your uh, restaurant McDarma's, uh, 
where there's many, there's a whole series of case laws uh, involved in this. You can't name hotel McSleep because a San Diego-based company owns the prefix for uh, an Irish-Scottish prefix, Mick, as a trademark matter. Um, famous case of the uh, music licensing body ASCAP in the mid-1990s went after the uh, Girl Scouts and many other campers, the summer camps, because singing around the campfire, of course, is a public performance, which copyright requires payment of a public performance license. ASCAP wanted a blanket licensing fee of $1,000 or more. I understand that there's been a similar situation in German kindergartens over proprietary uh, songs. Um, these are just some of the many, many uh, market enclosures going on in our time. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, well, it's, uh, I could go on, I could devote much of the rest of my time to that, but I, I wanted to just uh, suggest the, the great breadth of, of enclosures going on. At bottom, it's important to know that enclosure is about dispossession. It's a process by which the powerful convert a shared community resource into a market commodity so that it can be privately owned and sold in the marketplace. Enclosure preys upon it, uh, this private, this common wealth, uh, by depriving commoners of their autonomy and resources, removes it from the local rooted context so that it can become fungible, marketable objects. It sweeps aside the social relationships and cultural traditions and the sense of community that had previously existed. And enclosure requires also a certain extreme individualism and a conversion of citizens into consumers. And it often results in greater inequality. Uh, money becomes the coin of social legitimacy in the, in the new regime and participation, and uh, the coin of social legitimacy and participation. And this process, um, is often known as development. I think that's a term we might want to reconsider. Mm -hmm. I think enclosures are a symptom of a deep perversity and flaw in contemporary <laughs> economic theory. Essentially, the inability to differentiate between growth and the volume of market activity and market activity that is socially <laughs> beneficial and ecologically sustainable. Uh, gross domestic product uh, conflates material throughput through the market machine with human progress. And I think uh, they're, of course, not the same. But the fallacy persists for two reasons. First, GDP doesn't measure our non-market common wealth, the stuff that is off the books that belongs to all of us, which is supposedly free for the taking. And second, GDP never takes into account the incredible amounts of ilth that the economy creates. The, the poet uh, and writer John Ruskin uh, coined the term ilth to describe the opposite of wealth. And I would like to salute my colleague and friend Peter Barnes for drawing this to my attention. Ilth is the trash and pollution and disease and injuries and disruptions that normal economic activity inflicts upon the commons. And ilth uh, has many, many different manifestations. It includes the over-financialization of the future, which robs the people of the present uh, by converting their present lives into debt uh, that must be paid for the future. Now, economists have a nicer term for ill. They, they like to call it market externalities. But the basic problem is that the economy takes from the commons uh, in the form of free or discounted access to our shared resources. And then whatever can't be turned into uh, private profit is dumped back into the commons. And we leave government to take care of that. Politicians and economists tend to like to, to crow about how much wealth is being created but then they routinely ignore how much public ilth is being created in the process and count only the market wealth. Essentially, the accounting system is rigged. And so we end up in a perverse situation that I like to call the Red Queen's Madness, where uh, we're told that we can never really solve our problems of health care or education or social services or the environment unless we have generate more wealth. Uh, but then we have to keep running faster and faster to do that because we're also creating so much ilth in the process. And this, of course, is the metaphor from Alice in Wonderland. Well, the Red Queen's madness, I think, is now the very basis for our global economy because we need to keep extracting more and more finite natural resources faster and faster just to maintain the same standard of living while creating ever increasing amounts of ilth that no one really wants to confront. And in that respect, global warming is kind of a metaphor for our, this mentality and the problem. <laughs> 
And I think that this is why I want to talk about the value of the commons as a way to try to break the Red Queen's madness. If the market state, and they do work very closely together, uh, is an engine of enclosure, what then is to be done? I think we have to start to begin by recognizing the value proposition of the commons and then devise new systems that are legal, technological, and social to protect the integrity of the commons. And there was a tradition in medieval England, which I think we need to remember. It was called beating the bounds. And every year, the commoners would roam the periphery of their commons to see if anybody had erected fences or hedges to enclose the commons. And if they saw them, they knocked them down and reclaimed their commons. And the beating of the bounds was a festival, a party. Uh, it, was a fest it was just a fun affair, as well as something very essential to their community. And I think that we need to develop modern day equivalents of beating the bounds. Uh, two examples just to suggest how they're related. The general public license in software is the only reason that free software or uh, versions of open source software can exist because it ensures that the, that's, that which is created from within the commons cannot be privately appropriated uh, and uh, essentially stolen from the commons. So it was a legal innovation based on copyright law that is enormously important for the integrity of the commons. Linux couldn't exist without it. Creative commons license uh, are not quite equivalent, but they attempt, many of those licenses attempt to do the same thing of ensuring the shareability of content, be it uh, video, text, photographs, music, whatever. It sort of inverts the automatic premises of copyright law that everything is born private in a very strict envelope of, strict, of private control. Um, so what I'd want to suggest is that the commons gives us a new vocabulary for imagining a different sort of future. And it helps us develop a, narr a new narrative about value than the one sanctioned by uh, conventional economics and policy. It helps us do what the market state has trouble doing. It keeps important parts of nature and culture and community inalienable. And it cultivates an ethic of sufficiency. The commons helps us see that we're actually richer than we thought we were. It's just that this wealth is not a private commodity or money. It's actually socially created wealth in which a distinct, it's embedded in distinct communities of interest that act as stewards of the wealth. The wealth can't simply be bought and sold like a commodity. And more, moreover, this wealth will disappear unless the integrity of the commons is protected so that it can remain generative over time. So let me illustrate this with a few examples. This is Rajendra Singh uh, of India. He heads, uh, the, was the founder of a group called Young India Association that has helped heal the local ecosystem of Rajasthan by way of the commons. Several rivers had completely dried, dried up there through overuse. But by applying some near forgotten indigenous Indian knowledge about hydrology and small dams, and by treating the groundwater and rivers as sacred resources that were subject to community stewardship and participation, the Young India Association was able to bring five dry uh, riverbeds back to life and to raise gr groundwater levels by 20 feet. And the soil has become moist and fertile again, and people who had abandoned it have moved back to farm and start businesses. I was in India, India in two, uh, January 2010, so I have another story of how self-organized commoners uh, helped overcome some of the pathologies of free markets. In the small village of uh, Arakapuli, two hours west of Hyderabad, a community of rural poor women from the uh, lowest caste in India, the so-called Dalits, uh, used to be bonded laborers working on a landlord's farm. And they only had enough to eat one meal a day. Uh, and then they came up with the idea of searching for and regenerating dozens of traditional seeds, seeds that their parents and grand, or their grandparents and before them had grown, but had grown into use, disuse. And they had to search through attics and all sorts of obscure places to recover these seeds and then replant them and regenerate them and use traditional farming methods. What was so fascinating is they planted multiple seeds in one sowing so that no matter what the weather was, some would always come up. And so it was like an ins a portfolio insurance policy that assured uh, a greater return. And moreover, the seeds were more adapted to the semi-arid ecosystem of Andhra Pradesh than the monoculture crops that had been pushed on them as the more efficient 
market, market uh, substitute. So this self-provisioning model has allowed them to now have two meals a day, as well as the dignity uh, and empowerment that came with being the stewards of their own historic uh, traditional seeds. I was extremely moved when I saw them and they proudly displayed their, their seeds in front of me um, because it was, uh, it was their life and livelihood that was far better than both one meal a day and being uh, subject to the vagaries of the agriculture markets. Another final uh, example from the, the south before I move to more uh, industrialized areas is the system of rice intensification, which is kind of a kind of open source agriculture where farmers in 40 different countries from Sri Lanka to India to uh, Cuba trade information over the internet uh, as a bottom-up community about how to improve rice yields with normal rice crops. No GMOs, no pesticides, uh, no synthetic anything. And uh, I might add, with no assistance from government ministries or experts. It was a total grassroots thing. And I was told uh, that in many places, yields have improved two, two three, four times the previous amounts. Uh, it wasn't the seeds that needed to be changed. It was the practices of how they grew them in their distinct locations. Uh, an interesting example of how the internet and environmental practice can, are melding in very creative ways. But there are all sorts of smaller scale uh, traditional commons. Uh, well, th these are the smaller scale traditional commons, but there are many others that we can study that are alive and well in modern industrialized societies as well. Uh, urban gardens are a very flourishing model throughout uh, Europe and the US as are things like co-working spaces and co-housing developments. There are many reclaim the city movements that are demanding that public spaces be preserved, not given over to private development or transportation. There, there's the innovation of particip participatory budgeting pioneered by the city of Porto Alegre, Brazil, that's been adopted by a number of cities. And uh, even San Francisco is now innovating in this area. They've appointed a formal task force to uh, explore how the sharing economy of collaborative consumption and other uh, collaborative management of resources can be used within their city. Uh, I might add there's a whole category of commons that I call state trustee commons. Uh, I like to call them state trustee commons because it emphasizes they're not government property. They're the, the government acting as trustees for all of us. These, there's many familiar examples, such as libraries and parks and social services, management of public lands, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, taxpayer-supported research, and infrastructure. Uh, the state can also, however, help charter independent commons uh, on larger scales. I, one of my favorite examples is the Alaska Permanent Fund, which uh, reserves a share of royalties from oil drilled on state lands puts it into a trust fund owned by all the residents of Alaska, and every year it kicks off dividends uh, that amount to roughly $1,000. This year, I think it's, uh, it's uh, $878. It's been as high as $1,200 or $1,500 a year per individual. So ordinary people, like wealthy people, can have non-wage income uh, from assets that uh, arguably belong to them. Perhaps one of the most powerful uh, forces propelling the commons paradigm is the internet, which is uh, sort of a great hosting infrastructure. I, I described a lot of these in my book, Viral Spiral, how the commoners built a digital republic of their own. Um, it describes how with the rise of the web, uh, it unleashed this incredible wave of innovation, much of it driven by self-organized social commons. Now one reason that this works is because the internet allows low cost social communication and organization on a global scale. And this has enabled digital communities to undercut the enormous overhead costs associated with conventional markets. The commons can essentially out compete or as many of us like to say out cooperate uh, the market by providing better value. We don't have the lawyers, the advertising, the talent recruitment, the ta talent promotion, and all the other complex expensive costs associated with markets. And I call this the great value shift, that open platforms are enabling an explosion of user-driven creativity, uh, much of which both enhances commerce and culture. Um, Harvard Law professor Yohai Benkler calls this uh, certain types of this, commons-based peer production. 
and he, he wrote in his book, The Wealth of Networks, what we are seeing now is the emergence of more effective collective action practices that are decentralized, but do not rely on either the price system or a managerial structure for coordination. So Benkler's term, commons-based uh, peer production, describes systems that are collaborative and non-proprietary and based on sharing resources, quote, sharing resources and outputs among widely distributed, loosely connected individuals who cooperate with each other. Open platforms on the internet are forcing a shift not only in business strategy and organizational behavior, but in the very definition of wealth. On the internet, wealth is not just financial wealth, it, nor is it even necessarily privately held wealth. It's generated, it's wealth that's generated through open platforms is really often socially created wealth that's evolved, sharing, and non-monetized, and it's becoming a significant macroeconomic and cultural force in its own right, notwithstanding uh, received economic theories. Um, now, socially created wealth has always existed, but it hasn't always been culturally legible or consequential. And uh, as I said, economics often doesn't see it because there are no prices associated with it. But the commons is showing that you don't need markets or government to create something that has great value. The commons is, in fact, a very different value proposition, uh, one that's dedicated to generating indivisible, socially embedded commonwealth. And with the proper governance, the commons are not tragic in any sense, but really highly generative. It's just that the wealth is not necessarily privatized or monetized, as it assumes that, as uh, economists often assume it has to be. Now, this is a serious innovation, uh, not innovation in the sense of a cool new technology, but rather innovation as a socioeconomic management paradigm, and one might even say worldview. It's a new old way of generating value. It accomplishes useful things outside of the marketplace and government. It's kind of a do-it-yourself project, a do-it-yourself project and policy platform that can start to interconnect with other commons and begin to scale. And in this process, I believe that commons-based models are starting to challenge and transform many real-world, so-called real-world institutions. Um, the bestiary of commons are becoming so large that I like to think that there's a commons sector of creativity, culture, and knowledge. And one can think of the uh, more than 250 million photos on Flickr, the photo wearing uh, website, or the Wikipedia entries in more than 285 different languages. There are now more than 8,000 open access academic journals that are uh, bypassing commercial uh, journal publishers and academic disciplines are reclaiming control over their own research. There's a, a very flourishing open educational research movement that's making textbooks open uh, and courseware and curricula open the way MIT uh, pioneered that uh, about 10 or 12 years ago. So, uh, and then of course there's the Creative Commons licenses which have helped just untold millions and millions of uh, creative works and information be shareable rather than automatically locked up as copyright law generally requires. <laughs> uh, natural resource commons, of course, are uh, very uh, generative as well. There's all sorts of examples I wanted to suggest here. Um, I think that uh, as a system of government, uh, governance, the commons offers, offers several capacities that we should keep in mind. First, it helps empower people. It helps set and enforce needed limits on markets, which we find difficult to do through other means. It helps internalize the market external, externalities I mentioned. It helps reduce inequality and social insecurity. It helps reconnect us to nature in, in each, and each other as we manage those resources. And I think it gives us a new ethical and practical framework for thinking about development itself. Um, now, I want to hasten that the commons is no panacea. Commons often fail because of bad leadership or inappropriate governance structures, and commoners have plenty of disagreements and conflicts, and we're still learning to theorize about commons-based governance and capacity. So don't, don't leave me, I don't want to leave you with the impression that uh, the commons is somehow a magic bullet that 
helps us escape from the frailties of human institutions and power and history. But I do want to say that at the same time, commons are more vulnerable than they need to be and that uh, they can be greatly supported. Um, I think that in what it comes down to is uh, the commons provide a way to uh, enhance freedom by participating in power. It's a way for people to become protagonists in their own lives. In many respects, the commons amounts to a, a new social organism or metabolism for, um, for governance and resource management, where people are invited to contribute their own creativity and make it run. So for all of these reasons, I think the commons is starting to uh, take off as an international movement. And I'd like to give you a very quick survey before concluding about some of the more significant developments. Uh, in Italy, there was a major, major voter initiative two years ago about privatizing water, municipal water supplies, which re was rejected by a, an astonishing 94% of the electorate. Uh, and it was cast as a vote on whether water should remain a commons. And so the commons has taken on a, a new public life in, uh, in Italy. There's even uh, many initiatives by the mayor of, of Naples to uh, help local municipalities deal with local commons and empower them. Uh, there's even a, a, an initiative to get an EU voter initiative on a European charter on the commons to help give some legal force to protecting commons. Many people in the global south are exploring the promise of the commons. The World Social Forum has issued a manifesto about the topic. The Supreme Court of India has issued a very broad and strict uh, uh, ruling protecting the rights of commoners in various villages. Uh, the state of Rajasthan has issued public policies to protect uh, forests, lakes, and farmlands and other natural resource commons. Uh, Bolivians are exploring, have put in their constitution uh, giving rights to mother nature. We have now uh, creative commons license in licenses in more than 80 legal jurisdictions around the world. And uh, to try to, to suggest the range of things going on, Silke and I produced, uh, mm -hmm. well, Silke produced the German version and I helped produce the, uh, the uh, English version that just came out of uh, these books, these anthologies in the commons which try to go beyond the academic scholarship and show the projects, the activism, the innovative policies associated with all sorts of commons. Um, and then the, the Heinrich Boll Foundation and the Commons Strategy Group hopes to uh, produce a conference on the commons and economics in May of next year to help explore these issues more. Uh, I've been working, just completed a book on uh, environmental governments, governance, and the commons and human rights, where we hope to push this even further to try to develop a new imaginary for how commons-based law could help us improve environmental governance. There's lots of uh, educational initiatives about the commons going on. There are numerous transnational tribes of commoners, as I call them, which uh, are highly active and dynamic in uh, controlling all sorts of different resources. Um, the power of common, the commons discourse, I think, is the fact that it has a rich worldview and ethical sensibility. It draws upon a rich legal history that I think is often ignored, and it's a coherent intellectual discourse that tries to span many different areas. Uh, it has constructive practical models as opposed to simply being uh, uh, an intellectual critique alone, and I think uh, also an, uh, an unexamined or underappreciated aspect is that it engages uh, our inner uh, affinities and aspirations and uh, commitments to other people in ways that conventional institutions often have trouble doing. So for all these reasons, I think that um, there's actually a strong future ahead for the commons. I often like to cite a... Um, uh, a, a French political figure and student of the commons, Alain Lapitz, uh, traces the etymology of the commons to William the Conqueror and the Normans, not the English, interestingly. And the word common supposedly comes from the Norman word commune, which comes from a word munus, which means both gift and counter gift, which is to say duty. And I think that this really captures a lot because I think we need to recover a world in which we all receive gifts and we all have duties. This is a very important way of being human, 
but the expansion of centralized um, political and market structures has, in many respects, eclipsed this really basic capacity of our needs for gifts and duties. And uh, I think that we need to recover that sense of personal agency and moral commitment uh, if we're going to deal with many of the large problems that we face. Uh, but I find reassuring that this has such deep resonance among so many different people around the world, from Filipino farmers to hackers in Amsterdam to German co-op members to American free culture users and on and on. And all of these are popping up somewhat spontaneously without any central coordination as if there were some collective unconscious that suggests the commons opens new possibilities and synergies. So I find all of this encouraging because when the theory needs to catch up with practice, you know that something very powerful and interesting is going on. And at a time when the old structures and narratives simply are not working, the commons gives us a scaffolding and platform to build anew, to be hopeful, and we very much need some credible, hopeful ways to move forward. So with that, I'd like to have a larger conversation with you all about the commons. Thank you.